All right, guys. Thanks for joining me for episode one. Basically, in this podcast, we're going to go through everything from the start to the finish. She cut up, put her on black list. I cut at options. They can support it, get dropped quick. They be my stock pick. I get some back in the cockpit. Turn a whole crowd to a mosh pit. I make it hit like a drop kick. Cause I got the key like a locksmith. Think I'm playing chess, I see a king, I'm at his neck. I'm three steps ahead of every move, now that's a check. Yes, they want to know my secret, it's because I never slept. So if you guys are interested to know what it's like to fly your 1500 horsepower burnout car around the country and compete in a foreign country and drive across the country with these two idiots, <laughs> this is the podcast for you. I had an idea in my head about doing burnouts in the airport with helicopters and, and dragons and lasers and fireworks <laughs> and... Uh, most of that. <laughs> so we got most of it, we, we missed out on the dragon. Uh, so basically, I rang John and said, hey, and, and I didn't really know John that well. I, uh, I rang John and said, hey man, I really want to do this thing in America. What's your schedule like? And uh, Oh, pretty flat out, mate, but I'll make time for you. So now you, now, you, now you can introduce yourself. So, hey, my name's John. Hello, my name's no. uh, My name is John. Uh, I've been making videos for 15 years. So, so John, John works on a, a lot of stuff. I couldn't even tell you what John does. John just does it. After hours. <laughs> uh, John, John, basically, anything, any kind of media you've seen while we're away, anything that was decent quality was John. Yeah. Uh, anything sub-quality was probably myself. So John, everything video-wise, John, and even this podcast will be put together via Probably John. What's you both mean? <laughs> John. John. Uh, this is Andy. Tell him a bit about yourself, Andy. Um, I like to party, and I'm middle-aged, and I'm married. No. <laughs> so Andy, Andy builds, uh, Andy builds crazy, <laughs> crazy race cars. So if you've seen the video of Gup's wagon doing that killer pass, uh, the no prep car. So Andy basically makes good shit out of bad shit. And uh, Andy is a pretty important part of the team because when something breaks, instead of me looking at it going, oh, okay, need to fix it, I'll just go, hey, Andy. Someone saw on some babies' heads and everything. And um, yeah, you know, maybe John gets his hands dirty or something. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, we've had a lot of questions about how we did this, how we did that, what was it like? I, I went to the track the other day and I would have had it a thousand times. How was America? What did you get up to? What'd you do? So basically we thought we'd sit down, us three, we're the main. Uh, unfortunately, Jay Benz lives in Sydney and he can't join us, so. Bad. Sorry, Josh. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> Something I'll never forget, and I basically, dreamed of what this would be like and this surpassed that tenfold. Basically at the start of this trip, I went to Alice Springs and I won, I was the burnout master of the Alice Springs burnout competition. I remember flying home. Flying home, I was in Adelaide, Adelaide airport and I uh, had a call from a guy named Michael Gilbert. Michael Gilbert, I've heard of him before. So. Michael Gilbert. Michael Gilbert, if you don't know him, is the owner and president of Power Cruise Promotions which puts on the, the, the event called Power Cruise, basically. Power Cruise is a track slash burnout slash drifting slash family entertainment event, which we all partake in. John, I actually met John at Power Cruise. He was working at yeah. Power Cruise. That's when you were doing a drag uh, burnout contest against a 16 ton Saracen tank. <laughs> yeah, well, I first met you in Sydney. Oh, Sydney, that's Sydney, right. yeah, yeah. Remember we touched, we locked eyes for a little bit. Oh, no, yeah. it, was, it was cool. Couldn't forget it. Bit of a glimmer there. <laughs> and Andy, Andy works at Power Cruise. Well, he doesn't work. He's a pest at Power Cruise. Just, you know? just, just <laughs> hang out. <a> <laughs> just hang out. But Andy builds all the Gups cars. So anyway, we fly into the airport in Adelaide, and I get a call, and, I'm, and I had about two hours of wait time. And I get a call. And I go, oh, Gup, what's he want? He obviously ringed to, to congratulate me. Hey, Gup, how you going? Did you win? Yep. 
okay, that's good. All right. That was about the, the, the end of the event for our summer nuts or red center nuts, they call it. Basically, he says, what's your plans now? So I had plans to go to America uh, and build a car in America and go to SEMA, do like a two-week build of this car, and we had a whole bunch of people involved. And, and it's very hard to build a competitive car in two weeks. It, it can be done, don't get me wrong. When people know what they're doing, this can definitely be done. Did we? Did I know what I was doing? Absolutely not. Making it reliable is another thing. Making it reliable, is it's, it's a really hard thing to do. So I had my doubts. Cup rings up, he goes, all right, what's your plans? I said, oh, I'm going to go to America and I'm going to, you know, try and build a car for SEMA, blah, blah, blah. And he turns around and he goes, why don't you just fly your car there? <laughs> and at this stage in, in my life, I didn't actually know you could put a car on a plane. <laughs> I, didn't know either. I had no idea you could put a car on a plane. And Gup goes, yeah, 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 100%, you can put a car on a plane. No worries. Uh, <clears throat> leave it with me. I'll get, I'll get a price. I might be able to sort it out for you. So here's me thinking, all right, well, just chuck her, chuck her on a plane. And, uh, and he goes, I'll ring you back. So I'm sitting in the, uh, in in the Adelaide airport eating my uh, bangers and mash or whatever I ordered from the shop. And uh, <laughs> Lobster morning. <laughs> he, uh, he rings me back and he goes, mate, uh, it's about $60,000 to get your car to America. $60,000 is a hell of a lot of money. Considering you can ship your car on a boat for, I think from Australia to America, it's about $6,000. Yeah. So $60,000 is a lot of money. 10 times the cost. Yeah. But the, the bonus of shipping your car to America, it's there, it's there in two days. Two days, you put your car on the pallet, it goes on the plane. Two days later, you're rolling that thing out of the LAX airport. And it's an absolutely great way to do it. If you're a millionaire. <laughs> I'm unfortunately not a millionaire. No. Told everyone over there you were. Uh, <laughs> multi, 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 multi millionaire. Yeah. Australia, and, right? Yeah. <laughs> Until you own a burnout car and then you just throw money up against all. <laughs> Before Gup got that price, he actually offered to pay for the car because in his head it was 25000 Gup goes, you know, I'll sort your car out. No worries. Get it to America. Let's do some cool stuff in America. Come to a power cruise in America. Power cruise USA. And, you know, you can pay me back, do a couple of power cruises. I'll get my value back out of here. People will show up to see you. It's all good. Anyway, he rings back and goes, yeah, 60 grand. He goes, I ain't fucking paying for that. <laughs> so we're at an impasse now. This leads me into my next part of my conversation where I sold my business. I sold the most reliable, financial, smartest decision of my life to chase dreams in America in hoping that maybe somehow I can figure out a way to make money out of this whole deal. Yeah. And like no one's ever gone to that level or gone through with it. Everyone says they'll do stuff like that, but no one's gone through with it. So the biggest thing I learned for myself is, and, and, and I suppose most people are, uh, you know, this is a problem for them is basically when you're feeling good with your mates and you're sitting down and you make a decision in your head saying, I'm going to do this. You need to carry through with that when you're not fit in the same emotion as what you were when you said it. So at the time, I was like, yeah, that's great. I'm going to ship my car. I'm going to fly my car to America, put it on a plane, land in LA, buy an RV, drive across the country, do burnouts from one side to the other, and live the absolute dream. But you wake up the next day in bed and you go, what the fuck was I thinking? That's a fucking... Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a terrible idea. So for me, I had to really commit to this. It was a massive massive thing for me to sell one not only sell my business so i don't have a job anymore this is basically my job uh so i was financially stable i started a business at 25 years old we had at our peak, i had over 30 employees everything was i got paid every week everything was rigid didge everything was good and working well i decided in my head that hey if i sell my business this will give me the funds to do what i want to do and hopefully i can make a living one day out of driving my burnout car in a foreign country. It, it sounds crazy. And <laughs> it is crazy. <laughs> so anyway, we're at this point now. I'm fully committed. I don't have anything, any job to go to. The reason we're filming in this little corner, I've got a whole shop over there, but our first, when I say our, I mean ours. These guys don't know it yet, but they're actually going to work for me. Um, we can't show you what we're building because I don't want to ruin the surprise. But this is a world first. 
I don't believe anyone's done this before. Did you pick that pink color there on that? Yeah, I like flames and pink, yeah. So this is the reason we're in the corner, but <laughs> it looks sort of cool. We've got some shit going on, but basically sold my business. You know, it funded, don't get me wrong, I got a, a fairly decent payout, but money doesn't last forever. When you're flying to a foreign country, buying RVs and burnout cars on a 747, money does not last forever. So anyway, getting back to it. So this is what sort of funded this trip. So basically, Gup said, all right, well, I'm going to pay half your travel. So half of 60, I think in the end it was about $62,000. So $31,000 Gup paid for. So I'm forever grateful for Gup from Power Cruise because honestly, he's, he's done more than anyone else has ever done for me in my life. Yeah. You know, for someone to walk up and say, hey, I'm happy to support your dream. In return, help me out a little bit down the track. Here's $31,000. Mm. Doesn't happen. Pretty good. Mm. And if you know Gup, you know that Gup's... Gup's a bit of an oddball in my report. He, he does the way he does things and it's his decision. Like him or love him. There's love him or hate him, I should say. He's, uh, the way he does things, I actually admire his business uh, attitude. He sort of, but not everyone takes him the right way. But for this instance, Gup told me he was going to do something. Push comes to shove, he had delivered. So I'm forever grateful to Gup. For, thank you very much for getting me to, uh, getting me to America, basically. So, but anyway, so we fast forward. Once we committed to this deal, we started the paperwork for the, uh, for the uh, like the uh, import, import approval. approval. So basically we've got, I'm talking to people in America, uh, trying to get my car approved. In the end, we got it on a race car exemption, which basically means that my car is classified as a race car. It's not to be driven on the road. It's not to be doing anything, basically a normal car do, does. Did and- you not drive it on the road? Oh. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> so, backwards and forwards. And, and, and the thing about this is, right, Gup rings me up. He goes, okay, I've got a guy. He'll sort everything out. Ring him up. He'll sort it. I ring the guy. And I say, hey, mate, you know, Gup uh, gave me your number. You know, let me know what you need, blah, 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 blah. And he sort of just wasn't really interested. Like, I don't I know the guy. He was nice enough. But in the end, he's like, here's the number. You ring. You sort. So in the end, I was uh, left to sort everything out, which I didn't mind. I like to have control. Take control, of Take control of it. You know, I'm the one sending my car. I'm the one spending the money. I want to know what the fuck's going on. So we took control of the situation. We ended up getting approved. We used uh, Esmeralda, her name was, lovely lady. Uh, for all the good work, she, I bought her a pack of Tim Tams and uh, <laughs> brought it over on the plane. Uh, but we got all our exemptions and then it come down to, all right, D-Day. D-Day for us was... Toowoomba Well Camp Airport. And this was a funny one. It's a bit tough to go there <laughs> On the stage. day. It was <laughs> on the day. So I told Gup, right? So I have a, I, I have a friend of mine. I have a friend of mine, but she recently gained employment at this airport. And she messaged me and she goes, hey, Kyle, I heard you're coming to bring your burnout car, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely going to bring my burnout car. We're going to film it going onto the plane. It's going to be a, you know, it'd be cool. I said, hey, who do we see about doing a burnout? And she goes, ah, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. <laughs> so me taking that, I go, okay, well, she said it was fine. I don't really know her role here. It's, but I'm surely we can't do burnouts in a blown burnout car on a brand new airport. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, but anyway, I took a word for it. And we, uh, so D-Day, I said to the boys, I said, all right, be at my house at, what was it? Seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. We flew uh, my homie Troy from Warspeed down. To, we flew him to Brisbane. He jumped in the car. Okay, so he, I wanted him to check over, but it was also I wanted him to experience the whole, the whole thing. It was a pretty big deal for anyone. This is, this is a big deal. Uh, I think, I believe Josh was here too, wasn't he? Josh come to the airport? First day? He was there. <laughs> yeah, he was there. He moved there. Yeah, so all, all the gang was together. Basically, we drove from Brisbane to Toowoomba. Toowoomba and we, so we get to the airport. And I remember getting to the airport and I'm like, there's no one here. There was no one in the airport at all. This was like, I think they have flights early in the morning. By the time we got there, there was just, there was no one. But was it on the way as well? You were talking to them and then trying to organize a plan before you even arrived there because yeah. they had no idea. It was like through 10 different people. So we walk into the airport. I see the friend of my family's and I said, hey, hey, yeah, blah, blah, blah. She goes, this is, what was old mate's name? Anyway, guy says, say his name was Jeff. We're just going to call him Jeff for now. Jeff. So we go up and see Jeff and we say to Jeff, how you going, mate? My name's Kyle. Uh, 
We've got our car here. We're flying it on 747 tomorrow. We just want to do some filming. Uh, what do you reckon? And in, in the interim, actually, Gup and a few other of his mates had landed a helicopter in the airfield. So they'd, they'd flown a helicopter from the Gold Coast, wherever they were, to Toowoomba to film this burnout slash helicopter thing we got going on. And uh, Oh, when it goes to him, he goes, there'll be absolutely no burnouts. There'll be no flying of helicopters around cars. There'll be none, no, nothing. No deal. <laughs> no deal. No deal. And okay, so, so for me, standing there, telling people like Gup, Andy, John, uh, Troy, Josh, telling these guys, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. We're going to do burnouts and there's going to be helicopters and smoke and shit everywhere. You know, helicopter hovering above my car and it's going to be great. At this stage, we basically sit, sitting there and we had zero Everyone's opportunity. Everyone's like, what do we do now? We can't just film loading it onto a plane. Yeah. So this was the day before the plane. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. was meant to be that in my head, this is the day where we smash everything out, make a cool video. And <clears throat> I guess you can see how the video turned out. ended up getting in contact with a lady called Kelly and now Kelly was pretty high up at this airport. She was wearing a air hostess uniform, remember, remember, and it was like, but I'm pretty sure she was like the general manager of the airport. So, so we got onto Kelly and Kelly goes, comes over and she goes, okay, Kyle, what do you want to do? And I said, what I want to do is I want to do a burnout and I want my mate in this helicopter here to film me doing a burnout and he can twirl around and I'll do some burnouts and we can get in and out of the helicopter and we can make this great video. And basically, Kelly said no. She goes, not happening. Not happening. Like, <laughs> not, not like, not a thing. Uh, and some some swift uh, talking from me, basically insur assuring her that nothing will go wrong. We're professionals. We do this all the time. This will be the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> and she started to. I saw a little bit of movement in her attitude. And she was a lovely lady in the end. She was really good. She helped us so much. But she had to obviously go to her bosses and bosses and bosses and bosses until you get to someone that can actually give us approval to do this. Because no one wants to say, hey, here's a $30 million airport. Just go and cut was, sick. Because they've got to, you know, they've got to comply to all regulations and they can't just let people do burnouts on airports and stuff like that. So anyway, in the end, we managed to swindle ourselves a small slither of concrete in the airport. <laughs> the problem we had is, remember they said that they had the car park and they took me to this massive big car park and they go, you can do whatever you want here. And I said, I'm going to leave black marks Forever. everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, but you can wash them off. Yeah, you can, no, nah, <laughs> they, they, they told me you could wash them off. And I said, yeah, no, yeah, no it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, but they, the problem was we couldn't land the, uh, couldn't land the helicopter there. Oh, you wouldn't, yeah. Couldn't get in close enough there. So because it was off the air side, we couldn't land the helicopter on the ground. So for me, out in our heads, we were, I was getting out of the helicopter and I was getting in the car, doing a burnout, getting back in the helicopter and flying away. Couldn't do it. So that, that area was perfect. As you've seen in the video, we had a little slither of concrete. And they said, whatever you do, don't touch that, don't touch that, stay on this little slither. And it wasn't wide enough to flick around a car. Like, so we, we agreed on the, the air side where we could get in and out of the helicopter. And she goes, all right, no worries. Let's go do it. And then she bails me up in the car. She goes, so what are you actually going to do here? And I said, well, I'm just going to send it and hopefully everything works well. And I was sort of... She was a champion. Was she, yeah. She, yeah, she was good. She was good. So as you saw, the video, we, in the end, we got approval. Everything worked out well. No one was hurt. It made a really awesome video. John tried his best to capture it and you put know, it together. That pilot, though, was crazy. Can we talk about the pilot? Dude, he was... So he um, put GoPros on the the bottom of the plane but he's just like oh just just yeah, stick a helicopter. Yeah, a helicopter yeah sorry <laughs> helicopter and then he ended up like zip tying it and duct taping it to there but then when he was flying he was aiming the cameras the at the, the burnout yeah instead yeah. of like looking down he was just like so he wanted a gimbal he goes you got any gimbals yeah. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> like why would we have a gimbal, <laughs> he's like, Don't put the gimbal so this guy 
at the start, I was like, what do you want a gimbal for, dude? Just go up in the helicopter. The boys can film out the window. It's no problem. Little did we know, this guy's probably one of the best helicopter pilots in the world. And he is like a proper G. Like, I remember going up in the helicopter, getting sick in a small amount of time. There's so many G-forces on the helicopter. I'm thinking, in my helmet and gear, trying to sit there looking all cool. I'm thinking, holy shit, I really want to hang on because this guy's <laughs> killing it. And uh, so what we did is we zip-tied the camera, the, the GoPro the fixed. Two, two GoPros fixed on the helicopter. So instead of the gimbal would obviously let the GoPro turn and we could control it or whatever. This guy flew his helicopter sideways, so the GoPro got all the action. <laughs> and he was like out of control. Like, yeah, and there was sheds and fuel bowsers and shit everywhere. And this guy was just... He was so calm. There's a shot where you get out to get into the car and he just casually gets out and just closes the door and just walks around and then gets back in. Yeah, well, he said to me, he goes, when we land, leave the door open, it's fine. Yeah. So I get out of the helicopter, I jump in my car, doing my straps up, waiting for him to... Because the plan was, he takes off. Once he starts taking off, I nail it. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, I'm waiting there, I'm looking around, and then I see him wandering around, thinking, what's he doing? He went and closed the door. It's like, I could close the door. <laughs> he was so calm, though. Yeah, it was just... He was, a, he, he was a really, really good pilot, and that, that made the day. Yeah. The helicopter, because of the area where I was doing a burnout, yeah. it wasn't really good enough for him to do anything spectacular. Yeah, so made right. he made it... He made it, yeah. It also spread the smoke out so it cleared you would, all you could see was you. And then, yeah. Yeah, so we do this burnout. Old mate does all these spectacular moves in the helicopter, in and out of the helicopter. And uh, basically, the staff from the Wellcan Airport were sitting there just gobsmacked. <laughs> this guy and his mates in helicopters have come to our airport, smashed black rubber marks over the whole brand new white concrete. Basically done the coolest shit they've ever seen, and we packed this shit up and we went home. That basically couldn't have gone any better. The only thing that would have been better was obviously a, more of a, like a runway to work with. A bigger, yeah, yeah, yeah. a bigger area. We could have got some speed and, you know, rev the car a lot more. But end of the day, we did what we had set out to do. We achieved what we had to to make the video, the launch video. Now, I feel like the launch video kind of flopped. Yeah, it was, I think everyone, it just happened all of a sudden. No one was really ready. Like you told everyone's going to happen. They're like, oh, okay. But it's like, it's the teaser to what happens. Mm. And then I think now you show it and then people understand that's how it began. And then yeah. it led to everything. Yeah. So like we put this video up and everyone's, because you tell people, a lot of people say, I'm going to America. I'm doing the greatest things in the world, blah, blah, blah. And you go to America and, and it, it doesn't really happen. Yeah. So we've made this video of some of the coolest stuff I've ever seen personally. And I was, in, yeah. you know what I mean? And oh, it's sort of, oh, oh. Yeah. And, and, and like it went, it went okay. Watch and keep watching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it went okay. It probably went, I don't know, 50,000 views or something like that. Yeah. And like that went okay. But I was in my head, I was like, this is going to go mega, right? Uh, but anyway, I thought, you know what? It's the start of the trip is what it is. We drove home and the next day basically started it was the start of the trip. Yeah. So dropped John and Andy off. They all had prior commitments, unfortunately. And me and my mate, Josh. Mad. Cathay Pacific, shout out to Cathay Pacific. They basically did us a really good deal and they got us on the actual freight plane. So getting on a freight plane isn't something that you're allowed to do. You don't book a ticket and sit on a freight plane. It's not a thing. Don't even think about it. Money can't buy you a seat on that plane. These guys, they reached out and we spoke to them. I spoke to uh, Dave. He was sort of the manager there at Cathay. And he goes, uh, he goes, you know, if you're lucky, we can get you a seat on this plane. So Peter from TJI, TGI, sorry, Cargo. Peter was great. Peter literally looked after all of my stuff from start to finish. And I didn't meet Pete till probably halfway the, through the process. And Pete really gave you like a confidence. So when you're shipping your car across the other side of the world, there's a lot of unanswered questions normally. Peter, Peter pretty much gave me that confidence where I could trust him and I knew I was safe in Pete's hands. So Pete actually come up to the airport as well on the day we left and we've, uh, we did some really good things for Pete and Pete was a, yeah, he was, I couldn't recommend him high enough. You know, these guys weren't even the cheapest freighters that we could find, but they were, I felt safe. I felt, you know, trust, I could trust these guys to look after my baby and, and, you know, something goes wrong in one of these planes or 
transporter gets put off a week, all my plans go to shit. So basically Pete looked after everything and we got, the next day we went back to the airport because this was fly out day. So Josh and myself, we had to go get screened, bags x-rayed, everything like a normal airport. You go in and you get all your stuff done and we were sitting in the shed, uh, basically they were called Menzies, I believe. So Menzies, they x-ray the car, they x-ray our bags, they, everything, as I said, everything in normal airport, you go in and you're sitting in this shed and we're uh, basically get the call. Hey guys, plane's coming, let's go out to the runway. So we're sitting on this runway and he, and I, still at this time, I didn't know how big this plane was. Mm -hmm. This plane is honestly huge. So back in the day, they had jumbo 747, they're called jumbo jets. And uh, I don't think they fly them anymore for commercial. But this thing is 10 meters longer than the old jumbo jet. So we're sitting here in the middle of Toowoomba, which if you don't know where Toowoomba is, Toowoomba is like a, really a regional town outside of Brisbane. And we're sitting here and we see these big lights and this plane lands. And it is honestly the biggest, like just massive, huge. And you'll see some footage now of the, the car going up into the plane. And I was still at this point, like didn't understand the sheer size of this thing. So basically the plane lands and now Josh and myself are basically on the plane and we're going to Hong Kong. So we've got a 27 or 28 hour stopover in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, I've been to Hong Kong before and I must have got stitched up because the taxi driver took me to like the Bronx of Hong Kong. Like I'm talking like <laughs> there's goldfish and stuff hanging off the walls and it's just like a markets. And I was like, I had a really bad vision of Hong Kong in my head. And uh, where we went in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a beautiful city. No rubbish, just really clean, nice, plenty of bars and hotels. And Hong Kong's actually a really nice place to go. What, no, I didn't get an invite? Yeah. <laughs> you were busy, mate. We were, we were, yeah. oh. where did you, you didn't go either? Oh, oh. You didn't get to go? You actually had a ticket on the plane. I had to cancel it. Yeah. So uh, Andy was busy playing with those, that old, what's that old thing you, uh, Drag racing, this and dribble race car. Those 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 guys that spend millions of dollars and get like there's four people in the grandstand saying yeah yeah. 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 Anyway, that's that's old. That's you know back when Victor Bray was racing, that was cool back then. But these days it's burnouts, mate. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, getting back to it. Uh, so we're in Hong Kong for 28 hours. Me and Josh did some sightseeing. Not a whole lot of exciting stuff happened. And we hop on a plane again. The last leg, well, second last leg go to Anchorage in, uh, so Anchorage is in Alaska, part of America. I didn't know that personally. I thought it was like part of Canada or something. It's pretty far up. So we get to, we get to Alaska and cause Anchorage is part of Alaska, <laughs> which is part of America. That's our first American port, port in America. So basically we're doing our customs in Alaska <laughs> at two o'clock in the morning. It's like 2 AM. So we get off the plane, it's fucking freezing. I don't have anything winterized in my collection at all. Typical Aussie, shorts, thongs, shirt, Gucci slides. Gucci slides. Uh, I, had a, I had a jumper and basically we get off the airport, they, they shuttle us over to, to the guys in the little hut. It's all wood, looks really weird. And they go, why are you here? So I oh, just bring my car over on the plane, car's out in the plane there, it's doing some burnouts. He goes, oh yeah, that's sick, show us a video. So I, know, I show this dude the video. He goes, yeah, it's really cool. He goes, all right. And as he's talking to me, stamps me passport. No worries, man. Have a cool time. That'd be cool. Have fun at SEMA, blah, blah, blah. I say, okay. And I go to Josh. And Josh is like a nervous traveler. <laughs> Josh, this thing, it was like one degrees. Like it was freezing. And Josh was sweating. And it, it, like to Josh, why are you here? And he goes, oh, oh, I'm here with me, mate. We're filming videos. And Josh was like panicking. And uh, it was funny because I was like, at this point, my passport was stamped. I was all good. I was ready to head back to the plane and get ready for the next trip. And Josh was sort of standing there, like just, old mate was grilling him. I don't know if, I don't know if it's just his body language that made him grill him or what it was, but Josh wasn't having a good time. And anyway, eventually Josh got his passport stamped and we got back on the plane, but it was the funny, funniest thing because throughout the trip, Josh was not a fan of a lot of things we did when, when especially staying Thank in Walmart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Walmart, Walmart car parks. Walmart car parks. Josh was, a, he was not a fan of that at all. Uh, so we get back on the plane and this is where the trip started to get interesting. So I remember Josh and myself were on the plane by ourselves. No one was on it because the pilots were doing a changeover. They weren't even on the plane. We're standing in the little area. It's like a, a crew area. There's a couple of seats, a couple of beds a kitchen, 
a toilet, you know, everything you needed was there. And then the cockpit. So on a freight plane, there's no doors on a cockpit. There is like the seats, the kitchen, and then just an open cavity and there's the cockpit. So we're standing, we're standing up in the aisle there talking, talking to Josh, laughing at him about how he got grilled and the, uh, the guy's trying to stamp his passport. Basically, two of these young fellas walk on. And I'm talking, they didn't look old at all. They look like 25. First guy walks on and goes, sup, motherfuckers. <laughs> and I look at Josh, look at him, and he didn't really say much. He kept walking back to the pilot's pilot seat. And in my head, I'm thinking, this dude's got stripes on his shirt like he's the pilot. Surely this guy's not the pilot. Turns out, and then a younger guy walks on, and he's going, how you going, boys? This gives a fist pump, fist pump. and keeps walking. <laughs> And I'm thinking, where's the pilot? Where's the old grey dude that's lots of experience that's not going to crash? Where's he? Uh, he didn't come. <laughs> so these two guys and uh, Gary, Gary was the pilot's name. Gary was, a uh, he had like a bit of a mix between an Australian, New Zealand and a, like a Hong Kong sort of accent. <laughs> and it was really, really like a weird accent, but you could, I could pick up on the, the New Zealand slash uh, awesome. Australian accent. Yeah. So Gary's uh, ex-partner, I'm pretty sure she was Australian. So anyway, Gary, Gary was about 40. He didn't look 40. He looked about 25. And Gary goes, so we're talking to this guy and he goes, and I remember I was really uncomfortable because he goes, yeah, they want us to de-ice the wings. <laughs> because I don't want to do that. I just want to get the fuck out of here. I'm thinking, dude, if they want to de-ice the wings, de-ice the, the fucking the wings. wings. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to die. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a, I'm a nervous flyer at the best of times. I'm thinking, if they want to de-ice the wings, mate, just de-ice the fucking wings, right? Don't, don't just, yeah, she'll be right attitude. Like, do that on some other flight when I'm not on the plane. Uh, so anyway, they go off and on, and they end up de-icing the wings. And basically, Gary and his offside, like, for the life of me, I can't remember his name, but basically they were really chill. And Gary was an extremely uh, experienced pilot, and he was teaching his offsider takeoff, landing, all the stuff. And I said, I remember saying to Gary, I said, oh, so what's it like flying now? He goes, oh yeah, it's pretty hectic, a lot of planes, blah, blah, but it's not my problem. He's flying the plane. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, he's just learning, man. They're like, you sure you don't want to fly the plane? Like, you're the guy, you're the captain, you got all the stripes and the stars and everything. And he goes, no, 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 no. he's all right. So we're taking off from Anchorage and it was nighttime. I remember sitting, they invite, they invited us to sit in the, the seats behind the pilot seat. So basically, I think they call it a jump seat. And me and Josh are sitting there, we've got our headphones on, we can hear the air traffic control, this and that. And it was a really cool experience. And, and until this point, we hadn't had a lot of experience sitting in the cockpit. Maybe mid-flight, the guys would let us sit in there, but when they take off, our other planes were so packed, they had like two sets of pilots on it. So they'd all sit up there and we'd get a little, little you know, talk to the pilots and ask a few amateur questions like, oh yeah, so you've seen the UFOs flying, and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, basically, Gary allowed us to sit fairly close to, the, to them when they were taking off. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's another experience without non-car related. Something you can, it's very hard to experience that these days because of, you know, security breaches, security breaches and all the stuff. And because there's no door, you can see exactly what's going on. So Gary takes, uh, Gary and his offsider, they, they take the plane off. And we're, me and Josh are sitting here going, this is the coolest cool, yeah. stuff, like thing I've ever done in my life. And... You didn't get involved in that either, did you? No, no we were there. Yeah. No, you were both free. You are busy doing shit. Remember? <laughs> so, we were on our own plane. So, uh, so we, take, we take off on the plane. Uh, basically, I think it was about a five-hour flight into LA. And we were flying towards the sun. So the sun's coming up. By the time we got to LA, it was, you know, it was daylight. I think we landed about 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. And... Uh, once again, Gary goes, oh, he's going to land the plane. So LA is like one of the busiest airports in the world. It is full on. So we're sitting, once again, Gary goes, if you want, you can sit, you know, in the seat and, uh, you know, experience what there is to experience. And so me and Josh are sitting here, we've got a little seat, headphones on, strapped in, you know, we're doing everything right. And uh, coming into LA, there was, you're looking out the pilot's window and you can see there's 20 planes around you. You know what I mean? It's just wild. Planes crazy so and because we've got the the headphones on we can hear air traffic control as well and they're putting brakes on and they're you know dropping altitude holding altitude changing uh you know directions and all the stuff and it was quite a good experience to 
really experience, yeah, what they do, how a pilot would fly into a, one of the busiest airports in the world. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, plane lands. Now, this is where it gets real pretty quickly. I thought to myself, all right, so now we're going to go through customs again. They're going to want to know what I'm doing, why I'm here, what the car is, why is the car here, paperwork, all the rest of it. We get off the plane, drive through, taxi the plane through to some part of the freight terminal, I suppose. Stairs go on. Walk down the stairs with Gary, me, Josh, and uh, the other fella. Basically, there's a minivan waiting at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> and Gary goes, where's he going? I said, I don't know, man. He's going to get an, an Uber to the uh, nearest hire car place, hire a car, and go drive to Fresh Owner to buy you uh, RV. And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, oh, we'll just jump in with us. And, you know, I've got a discount. I can get us a car cheap and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, next minute, we're in the car with Gary and, and, uh, Gary. and they drive us to some shed. Like, it just looks like a shed. And we walk from one side of the shed to the other. No, nothing. And basically, we're in America. That was it. You're in the airport. You go walk about 20 meters through this shed. Door opens. Back streets of the airport in America. Done. LA's one Done. of the strictest airports. Usually, mm. yeah. But I didn't realize, but because we'd gone to Anchorage, that was our first. So this was a domestic oh, flight. So it wasn't this was only a domestic oh. flight. And uh, so, yeah, basically, they opened us up. Gary, uh, so Gary, Gary said to me, he goes, what are you doing today? And I said, oh, we're going to, I've got to drive to Fresno, buy a car, I uh, buy an RV, sorry, and a trailer, come back to LA and pick up the car. And Gary goes, oh, well, I've got a two day stopover. He goes, what do you, you know, do you mind if I come? Mm -hmm. So Gary, the pilot of the 747, joined Josh and myself on this trip to Fresno to, to buy an RV. And uh, basically Gary drops in, we, we used his pilot's sort of discount to get a car. Unfortunately, it was a bit, risk like dodgy they didn't want to give me his discount for whatever reason but in the end we got a car it was all right for us and we drove uh three and a half hours to to fresno now me and josh had sort of been awake now for two days even though we're in hong kong we we're all out of whack with time zones and you know we weren't really feeling the best so gary drove we stopped at uh, in and out burger for our first experience get to fresno about i think it was about two o'clock two thirty three o'clock in the afternoon and this is where the dramas started. Fresno is not a bad little town, uh, but it's not very big. So there wasn't a lot of options for stuff. Basically, they had a big RV place there and a trailer joint. And I needed both things to go right to get my RV and trailer. So we get to this joint in, uh, in Fresno. It was called RV Country. It's like a franchise thing. And for some reason, they thought I was a scammer. So I'd paid my deposit for this RV I'd been looking at online and it was 5,000 American. And I paid, the, I paid it in advance a couple of weeks before I left. And for some reason, I don't know why, but these guys thought I was like an international scammer and they didn't trust me a lot. Why well, wouldn't they? You're Australian. Well, in Australia, we don't really deal with like people trying to, you know, sort of commit too much fraud. So they wouldn't let me, uh, so the plan was for me to do an internet transfer and I'd already sent all my money to an international transfer mob that could have transferred the money, blah, blah, blah. But we had some deals, some issues with the, with the RV we had to fix. And I said, well, I'm not going to pay for this thing until sorted. it's sorted. But anyway, so that's Thursday. Friday comes around. And unfortunately, the banks in, New in, uh, in they're all in New York, were closed. So we wanted to leave to SEMA. I had to pick up my car and we wanted to leave to SEMA the next day. And we couldn't for the life of us get the money to these people quickly. So I said, oh, it's all right. Oh, here's my Amex. Let's just swipe the, the RV and we'll sort it out. Wouldn't happen. They would not trust me to swipe my card at all. It was, uh, must be a thing in America, people somehow back charge it or ring the bank and you know yeah. say their card's been stolen. I said, man, I'm on camera. I've signed it. You got copies of my phone. Like either way, they, wouldn't, they didn't trust me with anything. So uh, in the end, I had to ring Gup. This is where Gup comes back. You know, Gup lands in, uh, in LA, ring Gup up. I said, hey Gup, I got an issue. He goes, what's that? I said, All right, these guys won't let me use my card. I need to pay them cash, direct debit it into their bank, at their bank, before they'll let me take the RV. So Gup, bless him, as much as he didn't want to, he drove around LA for two hours and withdrew money from banks and et cetera, et cetera drove to the, the guy's bank, the RV country's bank, and they, he put cash into their bank, which cleared straight away. 
So without that, I wouldn't have had the RV, I wouldn't have had the trailer, I wouldn't have had anything. And long story short, we got the RV. It was a really long day. It just, I wanted to sort of forget that day. Like it was just so stressful. <laughs> That's how it started. And this was the first day. You know what I mean? We'd flown into LA that day. Oh, sorry, the day up before. And this was the first big thing I had to check off the list and it was like filled with dramas. No one wanted to, yeah, they, they sort of, yeah, didn't really want us to do anything easily anyway. So, but anyway, at the end of the day, we got the RV, went around the corner, bought a trailer, got the trailer and RV, and we're heading back to LA. So LA was about a four and a half hour drive. Drove back, and this is my first experience driving in America, like really. I mean, an RV, a 40 something foot RV, car trailer on the back, and Josh is peaking. Like, because I'm sort of <laughs> tired, delusional. We went out and got on the piss, went to a bar, and hadn't slept right, been stressing all day. And basically I'm used to driving on a certain side of the road. I'm on the other side of the road. And we, we ended up getting back to, to LA. I think it was, no, sorry. We got to a truck stop just out of LA. Spent the night in the truck stop, had some good food, some servo food. It was pretty good stuff. He was happy to stay at a truck stop. It was a, uh, it was a really big, there would have been 300 trucks there. Holy so safety in numbers. He felt, he felt good. So anyway, we get to LA, Esmeralda once again. So because we were late, right? Because we extended our day. If I didn't get my car out of customs within 24 hours of it landing, they charged me $3,000 a day. So I rang Esmeralda. I said, hey, listen, I need you to... No, she goes, hey, if you don't get your car out, I can organize a tow truck to bring it to her warehouse. And that way I can pick it up when I'm, if I'm late. So she's organized a, a tow truck and I'm explaining to the dude on the phone like... Just take the windows off of the screwdriver and, you know, oh, yeah. just pull it back three times to put it in neutral and tow it on, tow it off. And hey, there's fucking toolboxes and tires and shit everywhere. Anyway, everything's all sorted. Esmeralda sorts it out, gets it back in her workshop. It's a Saturday. So we get there, drive the RV in, pull up the RV, like full on, just taking up the whole road. Walk in. Hey, you go, mate. Uh, just here to pick up a green Toyota Hilux. And old mate looks at me and goes, Hilux? No, nah, we haven't got anything here. At this point, I'm freaking. I'm going, what do you mean you haven't got anything? This is the address. This is the... Oh, the green one. I said, yeah, the green one. The only car you burnt blow fucking out the bonnet. Yeah, it's around the back. So anyway, load the car up, drive it out. So now we're proper independent. We've got our car in the trailer. We've negotiated all the issues with the plane, with the RV, the trailer. Everything sorted. We're packed in. We're heading to Vegas. From the day after that, we head to... So we met up with um, Gup and Nikki. We spent a night just outside of Vegas, about halfway to Vegas. And the next day we trucked on through to Vegas. And this was good because... But now I had my RV. So because of the whole drama at the RV place, I didn't actually get a real walk around. So I didn't understand how things worked. So the first night we met up with Gup and Nikki, we met him at a Walmart. Going blind. Yeah. So we, we met him at this Walmart. And we went to a place, it's like a super center for RVs. We bought tablets to put in the toilets. We bought the lines you put on the RV to empty all the waste and stuff like that, shower water. And we got everything sorted and we trucked into, our, uh, into the caravan park uh, in Las Vegas. And this was still a surreal experience for me because I didn't, I'm not experienced in driving in America. I'm not experienced in RV parks. I know nothing about RVs. I've just purchased this $120,000 RV in Australian dollars to drive across America. I, I was still at this point thinking, oh, geez, I hope this thing's on a lemon. Why would they sell it? What? You know, there's a thousand questions in my head. So we get to, uh, we get to Vegas and I remember the first thing Gup goes, he goes, have you booked a site? And I was still thinking like, can you book the site, book it for me? And then I'll just give you the cash or you know what I mean? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah it's all good. But they don't allow RVs of your size in here. So if they ask you, it's only 35 foot. <laughs> but I, this thing's 40 something foot and it's got a trailer on the back. So basically, Get to this RV place. This is the first night in Vegas. Uh, get the RV, sort everything out, sort of wedge it into a spot where it's not meant to be in. And that was us. That was our first night in Vegas. The pressure, uh, it felt like a, a weight had been lifted off my shoulders because we're here. Nothing else can go wrong. The car's not far away. SEMA is in two days. It's all good. So fast forward to the next day. Where the main story starts, where the main characters come into so this it. Is where, <laughs> this is where the boys, so I booked him a flight and this wasn't without drama. John okay. told me, <clears throat> John told me he's flying out of Sydney. So I booked him a flight out of Sydney. And he was also flying, oh yeah. I was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm coming um, 
from Sydney. I was like, oh yeah, put, uh, get me tickets from Sydney. So I booked him tickets from Sydney, <laughs> fucks it up. And I checked them, like, yeah, it looks good. And I was like, oh, I'm in Brisbane. <laughs> in Brisbane, which then cost me another $500 or something stupid like that to get him back to Brisbane to fly out. Turns out Andy was in Sydney. Andy probably could have flew me to Sydney. I could have flown out of Sydney, but I couldn't because John was going to fly to Brisbane. It's like... Yeah, we wanted to be on the same plane. Yeah, yeah we want to hold hands in turbulence. So, so anyway, John and Andy land. So <clears throat> before they'd landed, we'd put the trailer on Gup's, Gup's Chev. So, <clears throat> which in, introducing Wally. So Wally was my contact for Hoonigan at SEMA. Hmm. Now, Ameri I don't know if it's an American thing, but it's pretty blase on information. Hmm. So if you've come halfway across the globe to, to do an event and it's like, you ask him a question and he's like, gives you the thumbs up. And Wally's an awesome guy, but Wally felt like he had so much on his plate, it wasn't <laughs> funny. So Wally was like, yeah, dude, just meet at 11 o'clock at this gate, thumbs up. I was like, okay, okay, cool. So he, we picked these guys up from the airport. We couldn't even drive into the airport because of uh, the height of the trailer. Oh, yeah. So we parked on some side road and these guys are jumping guns. Running across the main street and everything. Yeah, we jump in the car and I remember this is some of the best feeling of the trip because it's like, right, there's no stress, we're here. It's locked and loaded. Locked and loaded, we're ready to rip, we're going to show these, like, we're going to go to the burnyard and just rip, like, just annihilate it, right? And we get there, so um, we get to SEMA and old mate goes, oh, in the gate there, and it's madness. It's chaotic because this is a setup day as well. It's setup day, so it's not just us setting up, it's a thousand other people setting up. And then we find, we eventually found Wally. And where's Wally? Where's Wally? And we found Wally. And Wally was like, oh, I need you to uh, do this and do that. And it's just, it, it, was, it was a stressful sort of couple of hours trying to get the Park car. Park it there. Yeah. <laughs> we moved to five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there was Wally, which was sort of one of the main dudes. And there was other guys. Remember the other guy on the golf cart? He was telling us to do other shit. And Wally's yeah. like, no, 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 do this. And he didn't know who to listen to. Everything's happened at once. And in the end, we got him to the burnyard. And Wally was like marching up and down. He didn't know where to put anyone because it was, he didn't know what was coming or whatever. So after about four hours of fucking around, we finally got the resting spot for the Hilux for the... Uh, yeah, we moved it two metres. <laughs> five, 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 five metres. Sorry, yeah. So we put the Hilux in, parked it up. Now, this was the first time in America I'd left it in a public area, I suppose. Yeah. So we jumped back in Gup's car, take the trailer back to the uh, RV park, and this was, that was it. That was, uh... so, so because we're in America, we went to the casino. We were staying a little bit out of uh, Vegas. Out of town, yeah, probably 20, 22 minutes out of town. 22 minutes. Two minutes That's about how long it took, yeah. From, from, from the convention center, it was about 20, say 20 minutes. Yeah. Depends on traffic. Two minutes. So uh, we, we went to this, it was called Sam's Town, right? Sam's Town, we walked through there and we just didn't understand how they stayed open because there was no... It was empty. No, we were the only ones there at first. Yeah. Like 3,000 employees and like four patrons there. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And uh, so, so we did, we, did uh, we had a few drinks, played some pokies and... You know, had a good, had a good time. <laughs> and basically tomorrow was the first day of SEMA. Now, I, personally, I haven't been to SEMA before. Have you been to SEMA before? I'd never been. I'd always seen, everyone said it's the biggest automotive event in the world. Yeah. And then when you see how many cars on the day before loading up, you're like, holy shit. And it's like tens of thousands of people. So the Burnyard is in the SEMA complex, but it's in the car park. So the Burnyard's basically designed Hoonigan, um, Hoonigan run the Burnyard, and this is their way of putting on a live interactive show for the people in SEMA. And it's not like, SEMA, you can't just buy a ticket. So if you're an average Joe Blow and you go, oh, I'm going to go to SEMA and watch Lux of a Dual Burnout, can't do it. You've got to be approved as a shop to go to SEMA, and they put on a show for not the public, but basically people in the industry. So we go in, <clears throat> we go in here, and I didn't actually know that. It wasn't really common knowledge until... Because uh, people are like, oh, you can't just buy a ticket here. And then... Uh, the outside area was only open to the public. Yeah. But to get in, think, it had to be I up I think front. this was the first year where public could go outside. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, I'm not 100% sure on that whole thing. But apart from John getting his camera stolen. Yeah, within the first day, someone tried to steal my camera within like 
I was walking around and I was like, why is someone trying to steal my camera? Everyone's pretty nice here. But then it was open to the public. So someone ran past me and tried to yank my camera out of my hand. And meanwhile, I'm trying to find where you are. And I was like, holy fuck, I'm going to lose my camera and die. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, John, I was in fetal position. <laughs> so John didn't lose his camera. He held onto it like his firstborn. And uh, <clears throat> so the first day of SEMA. So SEMA for me was an eye opener. I'm used to competing at a top level here in Australia. Safety in Australia is paramount. Nothing, you got safety and then everything else. Entertainment is way after safety. In America, safety is down the list. And don't get me wrong, it's, that's fine. <clears throat> if you know the people that are performing and they're in their own head, they're safety conscious. But you don't know. You know what I mean? You can't, make, you can't really control their actions. So for us, you know, basically the driver's meeting was try your best not to hurt anyone, which is cool if you feel, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I'll do this and that and it's safe. But there was no real barrier between where we were performing and the crowd. It was just a wall that was about this high and then the crowd. Mm -hmm. So me being a pro burnout car, which granted they haven't really seen anything like my car. Yeah. Like it, also it's a really small area. Like they were using go-karts in it before. Yeah, like the area was tight. It was probably wasn't much bigger than this shed. So basically we go in there, they have a driver's meeting. They say, oh, you know, such and such, different times of the day. <clears throat> Everyone gets a sort of a rundown of when you're going to go. You're after this car, after that car. Old mate comes up to me and goes, all right, you're last. I said, oh, cool. I like going last anyway. I prefer to go last because I can watch everyone else. I can chill out and I go and I do my thing. So I go last and the first day was cool because we didn't really know what to expect. What's the happened to methanol? You mentioned that. Oh, the methanol was an issue. So you think going to America, trying to buy methanol is easy because there's race car shops everywhere. Thanks, shout out to VP for not helping me at all. Yeah, terrible. Like at all. Telling me you're going to help me, then don't help me. Okay, so thanks VP for that. Um, so anyway, we're... we're oh, that team, oh, the guy, I run their social media. Don't worry, send me a message, I'll sort you out. No yeah. problems. Absolutely nothing. So if you're watching this, thanks, mate, for <laughs> absolutely no help at all. Um, <clears throat> but uh, anyway, so getting on from that. We find a local methanol dealer, go there, get some cans. It was an ordeal. Another problem, right? Tyres... So this was the hard part, right? So I didn't know where to get tires. <clears throat> Some of the guys from Hooning are saying, message such and such, they'll sort your tires out, blah, 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 blah. So we show up to this SEMA on day one, and I'm like, where's my tires? There's no sign of tires. I got no tires. And in the end, the tires were sorted. They were just hidden away in a container somewhere, and we just had to sort of find them. Uh, tire machines. Andy was in charge of anything mechanical. Also, we had to kind of break in but also before we got in, this guy pulled up in a Mustang and stopped there and pissing out coolant and shit. Which, started which was, that's how it started. And that was the relationship. Yeah, so Western. It was day one, wasn't it? That was day one before we even. So yeah, so when we'd packed, we'd put the car in there, Western shows up in his Mustang driving around on the street doing Western things. <laughs> and we didn't really know Western. I, 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 I looked at him and I sort of, he looked familiar, but I, I didn't really. Sponsor. I didn't really know him, know him. You know what I mean? I hadn't watched any of his videos. It didn't relate to me. And I was looking at his car going, oh, that's cool. This is a blower, it's shiny, you know. And I didn't look too hard at it because we were leaving and Gup was in the car beeping saying, come on, I'm in traffic, let's go. And I wanted to have a good look at it, but I didn't. Yeah. So anyway, we walked off. I said, oh, I think I know who that guy is. I think I've seen a, I think I saw a net YouTube episode on that car. Anyway, next day comes around, the car's in the pits next to my car. And I'm looking at it going, hmm, who built this? <laughs> it needs a lot of tuning. Like a lot of stuff was wrong on Weston's car. And uh, which, which I'm sort of glad it was because we could tell him why it was wrong in the end. But, but uh, so, so day one, right? So we're at the driver's meeting. We have our really safety conscious meeting saying, do your best not to hurt anyone. You know, let's fucking show, you know, like, like Zach. Zach from Hoonigan is a fucking legend. Like he is, he is three, like, three, 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 three. if you want a hype man, Zach's your guy, right? Let's fucking burn it. Let's show these motherfuckers what's up. We're fucking putting on a show, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, all on one. And it, it was, and this is in my head. I'm like, right, we're in America. We're doing American shit. Don't worry about helmets, shoes, fire suits. 
yeah. none of that shit. So day one, I'm wearing basically what I'm wearing right now. Yeah, Gucci slides. Gucci slides, wearing no, wearing nothing. I'm driving my pro blind burnout methanol car, doing burnouts within two meters of a crowd. No helmet, <laughs> fucking just send it. And uh, yeah, it was just everything worked out well. We didn't kill anyone. Was it day one the VIP drama with the shrapnel going up? And well, yeah, we that actually... Was, that was the second day, I think. Yeah. No, it was the first day. Oh, was it? Yeah, so the first day, we might have popped the tyres. I'm pretty good at knowing when my tyres are going to pop, but I think one of them went a bit early, and it shot some rubber, some rubber sort of fragments into the crowd. And it wasn't just the crowd, it was the VIP crowd. Yeah, VIP. Little area. booth. So there's a VIP area where all, like, the, the people that are important go. Personally, I couldn't even get in there. As a driver, you can't even get in there. So these guys are important. Uh, so we shot rubber at 350 k's an hour straight into the vip booth would have been dudes ducking so we got a bit, little bit of a try not to do that again uh sort of talk but at the end of the day no one was hurt so it was all good but it was also everyone's reaction no one had ever heard a car like yours as well and everyone's like oh it doesn't sound like it's running right they're like Boo. yeah so we got a little bit I, I sort of go on instagram and you know see a lot of the tag stuff and guys american like filmers are filming this car and they're like Oh, it's going to miss because my car's like, rah, rah, and, and they're not used to that kind of thing, right? So they're like, oh, it doesn't sound like it's running good. And then we hit the loud pedal and it goes straight to 8,000 RPM and we smoked that bitch. But everyone... The noise bouncing off the buildings and bikes. And the, oh. Yeah. Everyone's reaction was like, they were scared. Like people were hiding behind the wall. Like first, like the loud sound and then all of a sudden the smoke goes. Then mm. I've got footage of everyone hiding behind the wall trying to film and not get hit by the shrapnel and just get covered. Oh, so we'll, like, show you, we'll show you that footage now. Our main man, Andrew from Muscle Car Tires, in conjunction with Highway Tires, sent us some tires over to America to test out and use and show these Americans how Australians like to use coloured tires. And uh, we, we ended up using about one, one a day, didn't we? One or two a day. Yeah. On one side. So we used a Hoonigan tire, our tire, just to give it something a bit special, right? I think the first, did we use colour on the first day? I don't think we did. So we used white smoke on the first day, but I was sort of saving it. I just wanted to feel it out. I didn't rev the car. I think the car revs for seven grand, which has got another thousand in it easily. So we just took it easy. But this blew people's minds. Yeah. They, they actually didn't well, know. Because you backed it into the corner there. And because yeah. everyone was doing just like donuts or drifting around. Yeah, well, they started at the entry. Yeah. So everyone would start at the entry and go around. And in my head, I'm like, eh, that's all right. But I want to start over there because I want to be different. And I always do that. No matter what event I go, if we're doing Dream Team, Everyone starts down here. I drive down the other end because the wind's going a certain direction. In my head, it makes sense. And I started over against the, the containers. Yeah, the, like the entryway, yeah. So anyway, day, day, one, day one was wild. It, it, it really opened our eyes to what was going on with uh, Hoonigan. And... With the crowd as well, like the main grandstand facing the containers and everybody's not expecting what's going to happen. Yeah. It's just like top gear up. Yeah. No one had ever, yeah. No one had ever seen like smoke completely covered it. No, you couldn't see anything. So I couldn't see as a driver. So those, normally as a driver, you can see a little bit more than the crowd, but it was just thick. Such a small area, no wind, containers, grandstands, no, like it was just sitting. I think you shut down the tram line. Yeah, well, I, I pretty much shut down the tram line nearly every day. Yeah. And uh, no, it was, a, it was an awesome experience. Like, as I said, I- One other old going across the boneyard. Yeah, we, we tried to shut everything as much down as possible every <laughs> single day. Day one, done and dusted pretty fast. It flew past, like, everything was happening. Everything happened pretty quickly. Everyone's response was so positive. He, I, Wally came up to you after the first burnout as well. Wally. <laughs> <laughs> His reaction was so crazy. Like, it didn't, he wanted you to do the next day. So, day one, Wally comes up to me and he goes, he didn't really even know how to, like, talk to us. He's just like, I said... Because I'm like, Aussies are very, all right, mate, how was that? She's all good, blah, 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 blah. I said to Wally, I said, hey, what do you reckon, man, all good? And he just looked at me, he goes, what the fuck, man? He goes, I, I don't even know what to say. And he goes, how many burnouts can you do? And I didn't really want to do two burnouts a day because it means I had to get there early. Because there's two, at SEMA, there's two shows, 10 a.m. 
and 2 p.m. So if I want to do the 10 a.m. show, I would have had to get up early and get out there. And Gut was our sort of wheels. See, we had the RV. I didn't want to drive the RV into, into Vegas. So Gut was our wheels. Gut would drive us to and from SEMA every day. So he didn't want to get up early either. Uh, so basically, I palmed it off and said, oh, no, no, it's too hard. Haven't got enough tires, blah, blah, blah. But they were so impressed with what we did in our show. They wanted to us to do that every show, which I get it because it's like a thing for them. The more crazy stuff you can have, you know, it's good for Hoonigan to do crazy. So in the end, I just said, man, I haven't got enough tires, which I didn't. We didn't have enough tires. Was it 10, 10 colored tires? And then you had to get the Hoonigan had my, eight. Yeah, eight. yeah. But I'd already used some at the airport. Oh yeah. And I wanted to save some for the Freedom Factory. We forecast where we're going. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically we used what we could, uh, and without using all of our tire supply, because that was a big part. We didn't run around our tires. Mm. So day two comes along. Day two was good because we could finally relax. We knew what was going on. We knew the rules. We knew the, the way the show worked. Yeah. Uh, day two comes along. Gup arrives. Gup brings over Jeff Lutz. So for me, growing up uh, watching Street Outlaws as a kid on Foxtel, Jeff was one of the main characters of Street Outlaws and he's a, he's a really famous dude in America. A lot of people that are involved in what we do, cars, whether it's burnouts, drag racing, drifting, you sort of know who Jeff Lutz is. Gup comes up and he goes, I don't think Jeff will go in your car. And I said, well, why don't you just ask him, ask Jeff if he wants to jump in the car and he goes, no, 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 Jeff doesn't do passenger, he's like me, he doesn't do passenger well, you know, like, He's not going to jump in with you. You're a fucking idiot. You know, fucking, you know, like all the shit you're doing, it's not really safe along those lines. And uh, I said, oh, I'll just ask him anyway. So I walk away. Andy's doing tires. John's filming Pelicans. Uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> We're all pretty busy. Gup comes back over and goes, you wouldn't fucking believe it, but Jeff's keen to get in your car. So uh, I'll show you a bit of footage of Jeff enjoying the Lux for first hand. And it was just one colored tire. But for, from my experience, the, the tires Hoonigan supplied me weren't great as far as burnouts go. So there's an actually a really, there's a lot of difference in tires. Um, Isn't there an environmental thing with a color or something? Someone was going on about you couldn't use them or? I don't know. Someone thought, people thought it was toxic because of the, it's like a, yeah, a different color. Either way, we don't care about that. <laughs> We, uh, so Jeff, Jeff comes in the car and me personally thinking today, all right, right, yesterday was a warm up. I checked the car. I didn't know how the car was going to perform in America. So everywhere you go in Australia, there's different tunes for different altitudes and, 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 you know, humidity levels and I'm in a whole different country. So I sort of took it easy. You wouldn't know by watching, but I sort of took it easy in my head on the first day so I could check the data and I didn't want to hurt the car. Basically, day two, I checked the data on day one, everything was mint, it was fine, ready to send. So day two, I'm like, right, these people on the front row are gonna get a show because I'm gonna send the fucking thing, the wheels off this car. And to make it better, Jeff was sitting in the car and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna have to impress this dude because I feel like I'm trying to represent burnouts as a sport to this guy, or Jeff Lutz, that's a, that's a famous drag car racer. So I thought, right, Kyle, Now's your time to shine. So for me personally, I like to wear a helmet because my car's too loud without a helmet. And I said to Jeff, I said, hey man, you wanna wear a helmet? Okay, the only helmet I got is my helmet and it was a 2XL or something. He goes, no, 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 it's all good. You know, like I got earplugs. I was like, all right, whatever. So I'm wearing my helmet and we put a colored tire on. And as you can see from the footage, the smoke was thick. <laughs> 
was proper thick and we did i probably did three donuts and i couldn't see a thing i'm looking across at jeff going do you know where we are because i don't know where we are everyone everyone was yeah and and the biggest thing about a burnout is even when you're lost pretend like you're not lost full rpm no blipping the throttle just pretend like it's all part of the plan because we're, you know, we're human right i can't see and i can only guess where i think the wall is at the end of the day, you don't want to plow into a wall with someone in the car or Gee, the crowd. With, with the burnyard, it was like twice as narrow as what you used to anyway. Like Yeah. Oh, man, it's, it, you go five metres in the wrong direction, you're in the wall. Mm. Yeah. So it was a lot of guesswork and a lot of sort of trying to play it safe, but as safe as you can be when you're trying to keep the car moving. Mm. And I remember sitting there like crawling forward going, I'm pretty sure that's an open area over there. Looking across at Jeff and Jeff's, Jeff's like, I remember him snaking his arm back in the, in, in the window because he was out with his hand. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember looking across, he's like, eee. and he's like, I'm like, okay, this means he's not really feeling comfortable. And I was like, I've done my job. If I've made him uncomfortable in a car, hey, he's in, you know, that's something cool. Anyway, I saw, see a small window of a gap and I go, right, no wall, send it over there. And once you can get these big cars to do a few donuts, the exhaust will blow out an area of free area. So I've done a few laps because I know I've had the room to turn and I've basically created myself a vortex in the middle of the, the pad. So I had some room again and everything was good and we blew the tires off. I felt one of the tires starting to let go. So I, I, I got off the throttle, did the right thing by the crowd faced it towards the barriers, yeah. hit it again, blew both tyres. I'm pretty sure there was footage of me blowing tyres over the back of the... Yeah, it goes up, it, one of them goes up and over into like the main entrance of SEMA and went that far. Yeah, it, went, it like went a long way. And I'm pretty sure I got in trouble for that too because it could have landed on like a show There's car. Also footage of someone's up in the car park filming and you look down and you cannot even see the burn yard. So we, we blew the tyres off and I said to Jeff, I said, all right, mate, after this burnout, we're going to get out and celebrate. We'll throw some stuff into the crowd. And I'll tell you what, he, he owned it. He loved it. And uh, it was such a good feeling to, to impress a guy like Jeff. Um, you know, these guys aren't easily impressed. So to, to, for Jeff to say he had a great time, and we captured most of that. Uh, well, not so much the, the conversations, but we captured a lot of Jeff's emotions in the, in the burnout. And it was a really rewarding thing for me as a driver to know, you know what, I took Jeff for a drive in my car and... Yeah, he enjoyed it. So he was so excited to get out of the seat. He was like trying to get out the thing, and he's like, "Yeah!" And he's throwing merch in the crowd, and they're all roaring. Jeff's like, "Yeah!" Like it's just, it's such an like a cool thing to achieve. And 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 day two was really the first day where we could relax a little yeah, bit. In the groove, eh? Yeah. So days to, day two also we spoke to Weston. Um, so before we didn't really know Weston, we didn't know his brother Garrett, the boys Wade and uh, Logan. Uh, such like good people. Good people. Really, really good people. And I remember the first time I walked over to Weston's car, and I think it was Andy, and as I said, Andy builds race cars. You know what shit takes. And we're looking at this car, and I'm thinking, there's a lot of things wrong in my head. And, I, and I'm not a mechanical guy. I don't like mechanical cars. Um, and I'm looking at it going, the breathers. Change a few little things. Just change. We could change a few little things and make this great. And... Uh, we spoke to Weston on the day and I said, hey man, you know, like you need to do this and this. And the guys were like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they just didn't know. You know what I mean? Like it's different. A drag car is totally separate to a burnout car. Yeah. Burnout cars literally test the, like the extremes of your motor. If everything's not hundred percent right, you're going to find a weak link pretty quickly in a burnout yeah. because of the sheer amount of time you're doing a burnout for. You know, a drag car, you might do an eight second pass or a seven second pass. And it's literally seven seconds of full noise. We're doing full news noise for a minute and a half. Hanging off. Yeah. Hanging off it for a very, very, very long time. So if anything's on its way out, you best believe it's going to find itself pretty quickly. So we, uh, we, we spoke to Weston. This is the first sort of meeting with Weston. And, you know, we gave him some advice and talked some shit. And uh, I figured out pretty quickly he was a pretty cool guy. Pretty genuine. Yeah. You know what I mean? He wasn't like a... Welcoming to um, advice. Not, yeah. You know, just... Yeah. yeah. Wanted to take... 
feedback on. Yeah. Yeah. We met a couple of cool guys that day, actually. So Zach, Zach, yeah. Zach and I think his missus was named Lacey. Mm. They were the turbo square body truck. Yeah, yeah he had a C. Was it a C10? C10 thing, yeah. Uh, he was a real guy, nice guy. He was um, that Freddie LSX. He was a cool guy. And these guys are like sort of nearly inf like car sort of related influencers. They do YouTube and... and um, massive following. Yeah, massive followings for, the, for, you know, and that's the kind of cars Americans know and, and, and love and, and follow is their kind of cars. So for us to roll up in Luxfer, it was like, they look at it and go, oh, yeah, that's cool. It's a big blowing motor. Like the other cars are the big blowing motors, but they're not the same. Chalk and cheese. Our car is just fucks. Yeah. It just goes out there and fucks. <laughs> And their cars are cool to look at, but they don't fuck as hard as our pro burnout cars. So <laughs> it was a, that was a really cool experience to, to sort of show those guys how Aussies do it. Well, you were the underdog and everyone always, in America, everyone always says, oh, do get an Australian over there to show you how to do burnouts. And you were the first, the only Australian there to be like, oh, I'll show you how to do a burnout. And they'd never witnessed it in person as well. No. And that's, and that's the thing. So a big thing for me and, 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 and yes, it depends how you look at it, but I felt like I had Australia riding on my shoulders. If I didn't show up and just let loose and do everything right and the car performed and I performed and all the rest of it, I felt like I was sort of letting the whole of Australia down. Yeah. And Australia is, without doubt, the best burnout people in the world. Nice. There's, no, there's no comparison. Americans are very good at a lot of motorsport. And they, even though they're getting there with burnouts, they're not on the same level as, as Australians. So for me to go to America and do burnouts with American YouTubers, which have a lot more money than I do, a lot more time, a lot more, you know, technology, these guys, it's, it's, it's not an easy, like, it's, in your head you think, hey, it's not easy because these guys have got so much stuff to, you know, available to them. Pretty quickly I realized, hey, we're all right here. Yeah. We're going to... Uh, I spoke to they put Australians up on a pedestal in regards to burnouts. Like, they yeah. weren't... It's no offence to the Americans. They usually... American, American, American. But they're like, man, you guys... Yeah. The show was a thing of two. They'd they, heard they about it and then they first saw it and they were just like, we're not worthy. <laughs> yeah. And as I said, the, the crowd response was just crazy. Because oh, yeah. it's like something they've never seen before. It just didn't look real. It was looked like a computer edited to them, basically. So day two went off, went off pretty much without a hitch. So day three, final day of SEMA. SEMA, we're, we're pretty comfortable by this stage. You know, day, we'd done day one and two and day three, it's like, oh yeah, another day in the office. You know, everything was going well. Day three was much, much the same. Everyone was sort of going a little bit more crazy. Freddie LSX, the, I don't know if he was like, he's like a Mexican or he's like. They just want to break shit. They just want to break stuff. And they, uh, those, those, those dudes are like, same accents. They're just wild, man. They just got these trucks, these short bed trucks. 26 inch rims. Billet rims. These dudes are doing skids on billet rims, which is, we don't do that in Australia because we're like, we can't afford to replace them. But these guys must, they got a deal. Dudes give them wheels. And they're just blowing tires off these billet rims and rim bashing them and catching them on fire. So the dude does his burnout puts the car in cruise control against the barrier, sets it to whatever the hell it's spinning at, gets out of the car, standing on the bonnet while the car's doing a burnout on its own, reaches down in the engine bay, just slapping the throttle open, car catches on fire, the whole back of the car is engulfed in flames. I'm like, in Australia, you would have been put out 30 seconds ago, yeah. but it's part of the show. And I'm talking like flames are just going everywhere. You, I could feel the flame from fuel cells in the middle of the fire. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's all good. Everyone's giving the thumbs up. This dude's reaching down and limited bashing while sitting on the front of the car. Just absolute wild scenes. And uh, eventually they put the fire out. Good show too. And it was a good show. It was, it was a dangerous, but it was a fucking great show. I was, I was probably 30 meters away That's watching it. You got it at one stage, isn't it? Yeah, they were drifting around each other. Three or four of them. And then they sent, yeah, they sent three or four of these guys out at once in a small area. The guys can drive. They tagged at each other a little bit, but the smoke and the, yeah, you can't see anything and they sort of missed each other most of the time. Well, they were out there for like three, four, five minutes. They were out for a yeah, long time. Their wheel time. speed's not high. New tyres. These guys are, these guys are out there for a long period of time. So they did really well. And I actually enjoyed those guys' shows a lot. Um, completely different scene. Like it's just so wild. Yeah, just loose. Yeah. Just 
no fucks given. And I take my hat off for zero fucks. <laughs> take my hat off for those guys because they were just... Yeah, they, yeah, they made the, the loose... Like, I've seen a lot of pro burnouts in my life. And seeing something of a different level, you think, oh, it's not as cool. But because it's not as cool as Smoke Show, the fires and the extra people and the absolutely zero regard for their car absolutely. makes up for it. And, and, and it was a really good show and I, I enjoyed it. And those guys, uh, he invited us down to his shop in Texas. So one day we might get out to Texas and yeah. catch up with them dudes again. But they were loose. They were loose. The crowd gets so involved. Like yeah. even the fact when you're doing a burnout and stuff to stop, let the smoke settle. It's all about the interaction of the crowd. And Hoonigan, mostly Zach, did an awesome job of keeping the crowd in, you know, keeping the crowd hyped. Oh, yeah. It's a hype. It's a. It's just a hype thing, and everyone's like off their seat, cheering and fuck. It's just, mate, what a what an experience Seema was. Day three, so day three was much the same. I think we used a different colour. Oh, so day three, I asked to start outside. Yeah. Oh, yeah, to get a run up. So yeah. Mm. So, there, so at the boneyard, there was basically the burnout pad, a gazebo or a quick shade. I don't know what they call it in America with a dude at a table with like sign, like forms to sign indemnity forms. And I said to Wally, I said, Hey man, I'm getting a bit bored of doing shit in there. Can I start in the car park, do a burnout through the car park and come in here at hundred mile an hour and do a mad tip in? And he goes, eh, no, nah, you can start at the table. So we backed up to the table and I remember I was sitting in the car, standing on the throttle. No, I wasn't even watching where I was going. I was watching the rear view mirror, the side mirror, looking at the people crouch and hold their ears and didn't know where they were. Methanol fumes, like, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not something you'd want to do for fun, put it that way. No one's ever been that close to the car, even to the, around the side. Yeah. And they were like, oh, it's fine, it's fine. And they, I don't think they had seen it, where everyone who had seen your car already were in like the barriers, <laughs> where everyone was far away. Yeah, so we shocked a few people that day. And I, I seen, uh, I remember talking to Zach's uh, wife, I think she's wife, Lacey. She goes, oh my God, I was standing at the back and I could taste it, feel it. <laughs> and I was like, why did you stand there? Like, she had seen my car. Yeah. I said, why would you stand there no, what's going knowing what's going to happen? Anyway, they stood there and hey, they, and it's, it comes back down to fuck around and find out. You find out pretty quickly that that's, uh, that's a serious bit of kit. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we, we tipped it in. Same thing. Had a great time. Stop, let the smoke clear and, and win it again. And that was actually the last burnout at SEMA. They, once again, my car, we shut the monorail down. The smoke was that thick, it drifted into the adjacent hotel and uh, the smoke alarms went off. Uh, there was that much smoke, it sucked into the aircon system and was pumping smoke into everyone's room. <laughs> Bro, there was a toxic gas going yeah, off. Yeah. It was uh, pretty frantic for the people staying there. So that shut Seema down. That was the last burnout for the show. Uh, it, and once again, an awesome experience to, to definitely be a part of that and to, you know, to, to be the person that shuts the whole thing down. Everyone was chanting your name as well after it as well. Yeah. They finally, they knew, like, like, no one had heard about you as well. And then now they were chanting you from the crowd on day three. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if people returned to watch it every day or who knows, but it's, uh, it went off without a hitch the first three days. Definitely, uh, definitely a experience you'll remember for a long time. Yeah, and that night, the day three, we're going to SEMA Fest. So this is where this is where my personal favourite part of the trip started. We uh, we got a word from one of our mates, Jose from the Bay. So Jose from the Bay drives a C V8 Monaro drift car, really nice car, really nice guy. Jose comes up to me, he goes, "We're going to convoy our cars from SEMA, which is the exhibition grounds or the convention centre, to SEMA Fest." So if you don't know what SEMA Fest is, SEMA Fest is a music festival at Circus Circus Caravan Park, which is basically a massive field in the middle of Vegas. Yeah. We're going to convoy our cars from here to there. It's about a mile and a half, two miles. And I said, all right, is it going to be cops? Like, is this, they know we're doing it? Yeah, 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 it's fine. Is it escorted? Yeah. Escorted, yeah, 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 it's escorts. Everyone knows we're doing it. It's, it's, it's all good. I was like, okay, well, I won't trailer my car. I'll drive it. You know, that'd be cool, right? experience driving on the street. 
because the cops know I can't get in trouble, all the rest of it. Yeah, cool. Okay. So anyway. It's escorted. Yeah. Yeah, es es escorted. <laughs> so anyway, we, I remember going over to Wally, uh, and Wally was pacing up and down, uh, doing the Wally thing, stressing. He's a, he's a good... He, he, you know when someone stresses as much as Wally, he cares. He gives a fuck. Yeah. Wally gives. Wally takes a lot on his shoulders, which hey, that's a good thing for 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 an employee. I said to Wally, I said, "Hey mate, uh, this we're all driving that car, the Seema Fest. Cops know about that, all right." And he looks at me and goes, "Yeah, it should be fine." <laughs> I said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Are we like are we allowed to do this?" He goes, "Ah, oh, it's Vegas, bro. You'll be fine." You, 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 he goes, just don't like do anything bad. Like I said, what do you mean? He goes, try to like not idle too loud and don't make a scene. And I felt like saying, dude, have you seen my car? It makes a scene on idle. Like it's, it is a scene. The whole thing is a scene. There's no unmaking of scenes in my car. Yeah. And he goes, ah, oh, no, it's, it's all good. So that filled me with confidence. I was like... <laughs> I go, all right, now, this is where my trip ends, my car's impounded, I am fucked. Cole gets in, light the smoke, and he's doing these ones. <laughs> <laughs> What's coming up? <laughs> I'm gonna die. Andy, Andy got Luke Fink's uh, camera out. 1996 handy cam, but it wasn't. <laughs> so, this thing, and I even, I, I looked at it and go, the two, I said 2000s rang, they want their handy cam back. <laughs> this thing was like a legit gimbaled, like, built yeah, like it was, a, it was about a $5,000 camera, but it looked like a $5 camera from the 90s. <laughs> so Andy's in the side with that. Me and I said to Luke, I said, hey, dude, don't leave me, like, try and shadow me, like, I'm, I'm a bit nervous. And uh, we had all sorts of people driving with us, but we pulled out of SEMA Fest, and I remember... Some dude gets on the road and there's fucking cars everywhere. Like it's, it's like, what time has this Eight, just gone dark? Oh, it was about, it was about six o'clock at night. Yeah. We pull out into the road, stopping the traffic, a line of race cars. When I say race cars, their cars are still fucking cars. They've got headlights, they've got brakes, they've got indicators, they've got seat belts, they've got trim. They've got all this stuff. They've got a motor that doesn't stick out of the bonnet. <laughs> they've got like stuff that makes the car. Mine is not any of that. Mine has no headlights, no brake lights, no turn signals, no nothing, no trim. And it's got a motor that sticks out of the bonnet that sounds like a fucking top fuel car. And it's hunting its way through Las Vegas Boulevard. So we're at the lights, right? And these guys' cars are just purring along as sort of streetish cars do. Like, don't me wrong, Luke's is a good drift car and had the other guy there with that carbon fiber BMW. And it's oh, sort of, yeah. he couldn't turn it off because his starter motor was broken, but you know, they're, they're pretty cool cars, but they're not a burnout car. I don't have an exhaust. I've got nothing. So we're sitting in the lights and we're just rah, rah. And every single person we went past, fumbling to get their phone out of their pocket. Yeah. Recording. I remember passing the first cop. And you know, when you're driving along and you see a cop while you're driving, you're like, this is me in my car. Rah, rah. Looking across at the cop. The cop basically looks at me, smiles, and then looks back at the ground. I thought, we're on, we're good. We're, and, and from that moment on, the, the tension sort of eased, because in Australia, if you're driving that car on the road, you, you, you're done. I wouldn't even get out of the driveway here before cops were over me. So to have that kind of appreciation, or appreciation or sort of, you know, just giving you the benefit of the doubt, SEMA, Vegas, don't do anything silly, no burnouts, and you sort of get away with things. That's really refreshing as an Australian to, to sort of experience that. So we're driving through Vegas, and there's, I'm talking, tra there was traffic. It was really busy. Everyone's starting to come into Vegas to party there. Well, well, just because I thought we were going to run out of methanol, because we're sitting at lights and shit. From well, I turned the car off at the lights. So we'd pull up to a light, and lights in Vegas seem to take a long time. Yeah. You could be waiting there four minutes. So we pull up to the to the lights here and, and, and I would just turn my car off sitting there, you know, nothing happening. Light would go green, I would hit the isolator, swipe all the switches, hit the starter, we're back on. And uh, past the, uh, when we turned right onto the, the strip, just before we turned left to go back onto um, past Circus Circus, yeah. the streets were packed. Mm -hmm. 
there was like hundreds and hundreds of people like basically filming us drive on down the strip and it was just such an experience that never in my life could you tell me that you could drive your car down Las Vegas Boulevard and get away with it. Get away with it. But there were so many cops on the side of the road, they were already there, sirens on and everything, just, just all along the side of the road. People control. They were controlling the people. They didn't care about us driving. So funny thing, we pull up at a light and John takes it upon himself to... We're in front of Circus Circus. Out front of Circus Circus. John gets out of the car you're in <laughs> to get a nice shot of me sitting on Las Vegas Boulevard. The cops got over the two-way radio speaker thing they had. They were more concerned about John getting out of a car to film like, me jaywalking. Jaywalking, jaywalking, jaywalking as opposed to me driving the car. Yeah. And I pretty much heard over the speaker, get back in the car. Get off the road or some yeah. shit like that. I was like, meanwhile, this car's like, boo, boo, and I'm there just running on the road. Yeah. <laughs> so John gets back in Luke's car, no problem. We, uh, we turned on the Circus Circus side road and we gave her some jandal. We gave her a bit of a, bit of a quick hit and uh, it was loud, because it was sort of undercover. It was sort of like a, it was like a little tunnel thing. Never a good strip. And then, yeah, basically another right turn past the army uh, depot thing slash oh, yeah. had tanks and helicopters and all sorts of shit. I don't know what, what it is, but basically we passed that, turned into the back entrance to SEMA Fest and uh, called it a night. It was like, it was just starting to load up that, yeah. Everyone sort of parked their car in there and there's security and, and all sorts of stuff going on. We put all our stuff in there, went back with Gup, picked up all our tires, toolboxes, and picked up the SP toolbox and we basically, yeah, dropped it all off and, and went home for the night. And that was probably it was my... Kind of weird leaving it there because it wasn't really sort of... It was... There was no... They said they had security, but it was just pitch black there. Yeah. 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 It was... Uh, and we sort of got our first look at a SEMA Fest, which was a lot of money. Mm. The money they spent at SEMA Fest was... Ludicrous, Wiz Khalifa, Nitro Circus, um, Luxifer was there. Luxor yeah, yeah, that, that was, they flew in for that event only, they flew, yeah. Yeah, they flew in, like, in there. Like, yeah, yeah, they pretty good. Gary, Gary was actually flying the plane. Oh, that's pretty good, yeah. Back so, uh, so, so we, we, we parked the car up that night, went home, and uh, the next day we basically started SEMA Fest, which was a whole other experience. It's also when you, you walk in, and you're walking past the Hoonicorn, you're walking past Travis Pastrana. Like it was like the biggest people in like the like car burnouts, drifting, like the Hoonigan scene. So uh, SEMA Burnyard was basically a show inside SEMA. Was nothing, no big area, nothing totally crazy. Forward, first, forward to SEMA Fest. SEMA Fest, they had aeroplanes hanging off cranes. <laughs> they had road trains with shipping containers. They had Travis Pastrana, they had Leah Block in the, is it Leah? Leah Block, yeah. Leah Block driving the Hoonicorn. They had dudes in limos. fucking limos doing... Smashing through RV. Smashing through well, RV. A, a moving the, the truck that moved the wall out the way to extend the burnout yard. Jim Carner, drifting. The dude, I have to mention the guy in the skid steer. Oh my God, The bobcat. Yeah. That guy was just out of control. This dude, two wheels, doing 360s in a, in a bobcat. I've never seen such control in a bobcat in my life. He could put it anywhere. I was in with Luke Fink one of the days, and Luke was drifting around this guy on the bobcat, and I could reach out and put my hand on the bucket and feel 100% safe. So, SEMA Fest day one. SEMA Fest day one was, we had to get there at about, was it 8.30? Early Nine early o'clock. Another driver's meeting, driver's briefing. So SEMA Fest is a really open area. There was high rises. There was lots of buildings surrounding uh, the big paddock. The main concern about SEMA Fest, in my eyes, was now... Spotters and shit with the guns. Yeah, that was... They had security with private security, police, snipers... And I remember at the first, the first meeting, it wasn't so much about safety. It was about, if someone starts shooting, go here. Mm. Our team will handle them. Yeah, yeah. And you look around at buildings and there's cops with guns. Sniper rifles. And sniper rifles and people on lookout. Like, it was a crazy experience. There was a lot of 
high profile people there, like, yeah, all celebrities and stuff. Yeah. So you got Travis Pastrana and stuff like that walking around and doing part, doing shows with people like that. And it was, uh, it was a definitely a different vibe. So SEMA Fest was probably catered to handle 200,000 people. And unfortunately, being the first year, I don't think they really got the numbers they were expecting. It was a new thing as well. No one really knew what to expect. And no one really knew about it. Like, we didn't even know about it. Yeah, I, didn't, we didn't know I didn't even know I was performing there until they told me. They go, oh, we bought you extra tires because you're doing SEMA Fest. Yeah. What's SEMA Fest? <laughs> uh, so. But big open area, no shade, 40, nearly 40 oh, degrees. Dry. So they had two main stages. Uh, yeah. Two, well, yeah, two, two, a main stage and a small stage, yeah. Formula Drift. Nitro Circus, Hoonigan. They had, remember that truck with the DJ set up? Oh, yeah. They had all this stuff going on at once and the coordination between the events was pretty full on because we could only do burnouts at certain slots. But we'd have to finish at a certain time to allow Ludacris to pay his, his slot. And Ludacris would allow Bush to play on another yeah. stage and, and yeah. it was pretty full on. So it was definitely action packed and it was a more open area than SEMA, so basically everything got more wild. Monster trucks, yeah, guys monster doing trucks. burnouts on fucking those massive big low rider things. Oh, the low rider jumping up and down. Yeah. Oh, the, um, the demo derby one? <laughs> yeah, they had, a, they had a demo derby, like once again, small barrier crowd, no problem. Yeah. Um, they had the guys with the lifted trucks, he sings at a, like Silverados and stuff that are fucking six meters off the ground, like, they just had a bit of everything going on here. And it was such a cool experience to be involved in it, but also such a well, like such a big variety of cars. It was a car festival. Like no one's really done that yet. I think it was, that's why I was so new. And no one's had like burnouts and you can go see Ludacris and you can go see Nitro Circus. Like it was so many things happening. I don't know what Ludacris costs for a set, but it wouldn't be cheap. He's my mate. I'll, I'll, I'll ask him how much. Yeah, well, you've had, a, you've had experience. Money that was in and out of that place because, look, I don't think they would have made any I don't think they would have turned too much of a profit. It's to get, it's like, I think it's like you get the name out there, the next year maybe they'll be back. Yeah, I think it's a long-term investment. But no, we, uh, we did everything we had to do at SEMA Fest. I mean, the, the, it was a new crowd. It was a totally different crowd to SEMA. Uh, our first burnout at SEMA Fest was... Pretty wild. The skid pad was way bigger. You actually got way bigger, the slippery. I actually had to back for the first time in America. I backed off the throttle, uh, wheels locked, heading towards the crowd at a number of uh, pretty fast not, uh, speed, and we pulled it up just before the fans got back up. It was fine, but it was a uh, the thing about the burnout pad at the SEMA Fest it wasn't a burnout pad. It was a bitumen car park, and bitumen is like not designed for burnouts. Basically, it's dirt with a small layer of bitumen and rock on top. So there was potholes. I remember tipping in, car was all over the shop. I didn't look at the pad. I didn't walk it. I didn't inspect it like I should have. I just trusted that it could be, it was going to be good. And after doing the burnout and walking the pad, I was pretty sketchy on the whole idea. There was massive potholes. I'm talking like a couple of meters and, and you just, they just blended in, you know, so... It was definitely, uh, definitely an experience. I think we would have done some uh, fair bit of damage. So the first day we did a first run. We did a second run in the afternoon once the second show started. I believe we, closed, we might have closed the second show. Or we opened up for Travis Pastrana, something like that. Yeah. And then we had what we called the Ken Block Tribute, which was 43 cars doing a burnout for 43 seconds, spaced around this arena. And the, probably the best I saw the crowd was at that burnout. The Hoonicorn was in the middle. Someone flicked rubber all over. I might have flicked a bit of rubber over the Hoonicorn. Sorry. But basically, cars spread out around the outside. Everyone was doing a burnout at once. My car smoked enough for the whole side I was on. Uh, we had some other guys in drift cars and stuff, and they were just holding their ears. And yeah, it was, uh, it was an experience. But basically, Travis Pastrana was doing donuts around the Hoonicorn. And that was our cue to do a burnout. So I saw him drift past me and I just planted it in top gear. It was just a well-coordinated exercise. The, the video they played before it, tribute to Ken Block, was, it was, was really, yeah, it was really, uh, really special. Awesome to be a part of it. We can always say we were a part of that. And uh, basically wrapped it up, wrapped up the night. Yeah, that was the kind of introduction. And that was the big send-off.
And then as soon as that finished, that was the end. And there was... Yep, that was the end of day one. So we still had day two to go. Day two, SEMA Fest. We made a bit of an intro. We made a good video out of day two. Yeah, because yeah, well, the f we changed up the format and had a more long form comp format. Because yeah. there was so much going on as well. You could move around and go to different things yeah. as well. So we went and checked out Formula Drift. We went and checked out some bands. Uh, we didn't really have a lot. I think I might have done two burnouts that day. The second day? Yeah. One burnout. The one just at night. Oh. Well, yeah, because yeah, they were, it was meant to be early in the morning, then it got moved to the end. Yeah, so once again, it was sort of hard to know what you're doing. They sort of tell you, and we were there pretty early. Yeah. And by this stage, this was day five of this stuff. A lot of cars are broken. A lot of people are lost, you know, just couldn't keep up with the schedule, etc. So the last day was pretty important that we put on a good show. Our show was meant to be at, in the afternoon. It got moved back to the early evening and then got moved to end of the night. Before our run, they had guys in limousines doing, crashing through yeah. RVs, monster trucks doing burnouts, uh, destruction derbies, guys trying to roll cars on purpose. Oh, yeah, the, the Jeeps and stuff are trying to, yeah. I, I watched the guy literally try to roll his car for like two minutes. Couldn't it. <laughs> Couldn't, it wouldn't roll. And then ended up getting the bobcat and just tipping it over. Yeah. Glasses everywhere. And uh, we were lined up at the end of the show. Basically, they said I was going last, as I no most normally do, to close the show. And we get a, I'm sitting, chilling, drinking a drink. And I think I was eating my dinner, which was brought to me like two minutes before. I was sitting on the back of my ear eating a burger or something. And uh, basically, one of the guys with the headphones runs over and goes, get in your car now and fucking go. And I'm thinking, but I'm last. Get in your car now and fucking go. Go quick, 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 quick. And it was all a big hurry. So that we'd overextended the time frame for this for this show for SEMA, SEMA Fest. And so the, the ten guys in front of me unfortunately didn't get a go. Yeah. But I remember hearing on the radio, get the fucking Luxifer in here now. Yeah. Shut this shit down. And uh, basically I asked for the truck to be moved. They knew they were gonna move that for me. So as the truck was starting to pull, I pulled up way back. I thought, you know what, this is the last burnout. Yeah. Let's send it. And I and I forgot about all the potholes and the, and the oh. uneven and glass and patches of oil and everything kids and shit. kids and we we sent it in there hard and uh basically we closed the show at sema fest the only way i know how and that is just pure violence the car was just revving to its 8,000 RPM, throwing sparks and tires. And tongue, by this point, tongue hanging out. his tongue was hanging out. We drove, we drove that car hard on the last night. Basically, I'd done my burnout. I didn't have time to get out and wait for the crowd because we were about five minutes past the slot. And that's a big no-no for a festival. As I drove off the burnout pad, they shut the lights down. All the lights. It couldn't see where you were going. Yeah, it was just like, that's enough. And over the two-way, uh, over the system, sorry, Zach from Hoonigan, oh, well, that's it. Lux of us shut us down again and blah, blah, and makes it part of the show. And basically, they shut all the lights off, and then the festival would start again. I think Imagine Dragons. Imagine Dragons started playing after that. Uh, yeah, Imagine Dragons started playing after that, and it was a good end to the show. Parked the stuff up, went for a look around, and... Yeah, we... I got to go on the slide down Nitro Circus. Yeah. John had a few too many beers and thought he would go down the... the what do they call that thing? Uh, mega ramp. The mega ramp? John went, yeah. John, John went down the mega ramp in his shorts. Yeah. So, uh... I broke my wristband, I scraped my bum. Yeah. <laughs> so, John, so we had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first major event out of the way. And... Five days of non-stop pure no violence well, yeah. hmm. and in between that we'd be going out at night and drinking beers and gambling and rehydrating hydrating also most of these days we didn't eat or drink at all until the night time no, no. Yeah. oh let's you bought the i bought a gatorade for 18 dollars each <laughs> dollar hamburger oh yeah <laughs> yeah so we kept sema fest off sema fest was an awesome sema and sema fest was an awesome experience if we get the chance to go back again next year, you best believe we're doing it. But at least this time we'll know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. 
because we had no idea what was going on this year. But awesome time. That just checked off the big first, uh, you know, the first thing for the trip. Responsibilities. It like it started off with the RV not going right, and then next minute you're driving down Vegas Strip in your car. You know, that's fine. Yeah. That pretty much wraps up our first first episode. After SEMA Fest, we started our journey from LA slash Vegas all the way to Florida. And we met some friends along the way, and I'll tell you what, we had a good time. We got pulled over by police multiple times. I actually got handcuffed, thanks to my mate Weston. Thanks, Weston. <laughs> and we, uh, we saw some of the countryside, which was a nice, nice change. Hmm. Unfortunately, Josh had to be in Florida pretty early, so we had to rush the last section. But <laughs> seeing America in an RV doesn't get much better. And having a 1,500 horsepower burnout car on the back of the trailer, well, just makes it better. Yeah. But thanks for watching, guys. If you've watched this far, hopefully I'll see you in the next episode. Peace. Fuck off. <laughs> Incorrect. Yeah. She cut up, put her on black list. I call that options. They can support it, get dropped quick. They be my stock pick. I get some back in the cockpit. Turn the whole crowd to a mosh pit. I make it hit like a drop kick. Cause I got the key like a locksmith. Think I'm playing chess. I see a king. I'm at his neck. I'm three steps ahead of every move. Now that's a check. Yes. They wanna know my secret. It's because I never slept. All my nightmares of me and 40 likes a wreck. And don't forget to clock clock. <laughs>